Go. Good morning. Today is Tuesday, April 9th, uh, 2024. Uh, it's the eclipse day plus one. Uh, and we are resuming our work on 8687, an act relating to community resilience, biodiversity protection through land use. Um, we are waiting for council to conclude a walkthrough. We left off on uh, the as passed by the House version uh, page. My copy is part that we made to the bottom of page 37. It's just one because while we're waiting for council, um, let's talk as a committee and let anyone who's following you know the goal is to. Um, Finish our review and settle on, um, you know, what we need to basically, the short of it is reconcile our bill with 311 and, and to come up with uh, uh, a harmonized report that we'll bring to the floor. It will lay on 687 and 687 will travel back to the house with the work of basically 308, 311 will be baked into 687. So, Standard operating procedure, but it seems to have uh, not everyone's followed the, the pathway. So I want to be really clear. Um, the pro tem is asked to have a bill out by next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. So on the floor. We are going to be, well, out of committee. Okay. It's also going to be going to finding and yeah. approach. So we're trying to allow time for that work. Then shore work, then to the house. We'll probably have weeks that's during which we can have the committee of comments. Unless what we send is so agreeable to them that they just confirm. Mm -hmm. That's 14 days hence or seven days hence? Uh, seven days hence for having this a bill. This Tuesday. Yes, for us to have a bill out. Then you'll see it all again in five years. Yes, yeah, sort of in miniature. I mean, we've already had a walkthrough in there. You know, I don't think we'll do a deep dive on the whole thing. We'll probably just stick to seeing how our finance pieces. But we did do a walk through the whole bill. Oh, okay. Sorry, I am not speak. Uh, I thought you were talking about 311. So that we've already been you know, for a new chapter. But yeah, we haven't. Uh, finance has not taken six eight. Six, eight. Uh, okay. I'll take that. Yeah. Well, that's the schedule um, as requested by the Republicans. A week from today out, probably a week for money committees or or the House. Well, I need to get confidence with probably well, two weeks' time, which is yeah, a good amount of time for sorting out a couple of weeks late, but come out as we would. Center White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wasn't that at all. I thought you could say this is why I'm like mm -hmm. blue marking. Um, yeah. ah, so, question for you about what you like process wise for us as we start to harmonize those three bills together. If there are sections that we like, kind of, kind of how I've been doing it okay. is I've been going through in 687 and saying, I like that, concerns about that, which, you know. How would you like us to, like, should we be expecting a draft coming from you as our chair at a certain point? Should we be making a case for certain things to go into a draft? Um, what is the process you would like us as committee members with items that we like, dislike, feel comfortable with sure. in either of the three um, That's a great question. Thanks for that. I, you know, uh, it would be, we've been talking about sort of having buckets of issues rather than trying to look at 132 pages. Um, so I think if um, if you're marking stuff like like it, questions, or no, yeah. something like that, that will be helpful. Because I think in the second half of this week, like Thursday, Friday, we're really going to have to say, OK, we've seen everything. We've taken some testimony and everything. Now it's going to be the sorting. It's going to yeah. begin. We're going to you know and start to put together a proposal. Um, and then the part of what I think is going to need to happen is that um, the program is also as the spirit of not developed that would be and do some new, basically negotiate. Yeah. So that we can come back to committee with things already with a, a whole revolution sort of moved forward because we're going to have to keep Closing out issues in order to make next week's day. 
So uh, the short answer would be yes, please flag. Okay. Um, yes, we're going to end up with some revised language to look at. And I'll sit down with council a bit because it will just be helpful for us to start to see uh, in black and white what we're keeping. <laughs> okay. Do you have an expectation of when? And would you like us to contribute to that draft? Yes, please. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So no shyness, no shyness <laughs> in here. I assume you'd prefer that by email, if or do you email as opposed to just because I can uh, drink and collate and okay. and we want to see my council doing some editing. We'll have things on black voice. So I'll I'll plan at least for me personally to send you the sections that are like. Good to go at 687. Good. Or is it that you want us to look at the, because we're adding 311 to 687. So it's mm -hmm. more that we would be saying this is what, well, okay, I'll look at probably both. Yeah, maybe I'll just send a big email. There's going to be, <laughs> yeah, I think there's going to be um, yeah, the great conversion. It's just like the totality. It's gonna, oh, it's going to be a singular event. And um, all they go. That'd be great. great. <laughs> Do you guys use OneNote? Maybe that would be a good thing. We'll do some OneNote. We have to send the notes, yeah. Okay. Is it by you that? No. Oh, you know. Oh, okay. I don't know. The millennials. No. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm apparently not right. You <laughs> give us 40 years old and then you are. It's a cutting edge word, perfect product. That's not even a joke anymore. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, great. So we'll continue on. I think we're going to have to push ourselves along. I, and it's going to be a balance because we've had a lot of good discussions and questions as we've gone. I'm also a little concerned as we're on page 36. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. yeah. 95 pages to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a lot of people at home have been asking me about the next 95 pages. So. <laughs> Oh, oh, I can give you your problem. Okay. Hello, Jay Cassidy, Office of Legislative Council. Good evening. Section 21. Yes. Okay. So H uh, 687 has passed the House on page 37. Um, so when we last spoke, uh, I had just reviewed the language in section 20, which is establishing a new Criterion 8C, as part of the Act 250 review, that would uh, require applicants to uh, um, avoid the undue adverse impact on force blocks or habitat factors, and then uh, direct the board to adopt rules on how effects can be avoided, minimized, or mitigated. So section 21 is the language on the rulemaking for this criterion. So the Environmental Review Board, in collaboration with the Agency of Natural Resources, shall adopt rules to implement the requirements for the administration of the new criterion ABC. It is the intent of the General Assembly, onto page 38, that these rules discourage fragmentation of the forest blocks and habitat connectors by encouraging clustering of development. So I'll just quickly flag, um, I have been attempting to make, on LCAR's behalf, uh, an effort to include intent language in new rulemaking provisions. Um, and so this is something I think LCAR has been interested in intent, Ledge Council is supporting that. So having a clear statement of intent um, whether or not this is detailed enough right. is the question, um, but there is additional language in this section that I will continue to read, but that is sort of like the flag. Thank you. <laughs> so, helpful two, three, five years later, like the rule comes through. It's not a clear idea, but the rule was supposed to come. Thank you. So the intent section is quite long. No, no. The intent no. section. Not that sense. Oh, okay. So once we're up on to like line four of page 38, intent section. 
Yes, it's not an intent section. It is a statement of intent for the rulemaking. Okay. So that when LPAR reviews a rule, one of the things they look at is whether or not the rule complies with legislative intent. Mm -hmm. And there isn't often an easy way to look at it, look at that except for going back, rereading the entire statute, which doesn't always have specific intent. So there's an effort to help LPAR. Because then it becomes in question at LPAR whether or not something complies with legislative intent, and that is a, one of their grounds for objecting, and it kind of becomes a bit of a debate sometimes. And more proactively, you know, so if we're going to delegate authority for writing rules, we should, we need to delegate the direction, otherwise you know, it's an extreme version of it, it's unconstitutional, mm -hmm. we've given away too much power without specifying how it's to be used, so sometimes I would say I've seen us Dela, you know, call for rulemaking with um, surprisingly little direction. So I think we're trying to get out of that kind of. That's fair. I have um, like more questions about the language because of the answer to that question. And I feel like I should hold off to 95 pages. So. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply it to myself. Well, just briefly. Uh, on this, you know, like, so I'm expecting that if someone were looking at rules that come out of this, they would expect to see things. You don't know that it may not be the legislative intent, but it would need to have addressed, for instance, one, the health force box, and the connectors are further defined, including size location, et cetera. If it didn't, if the rule didn't address that, then it would start to seem like it would have been fulfilling. My question is actually about um, page 38, line 15, where it it's like we have a definition, but it's general. You didn't even get there yet. Well, you still down. Okay. I'm talking about line one and two. <laughs> so just the first part, though, there's a broad statement about discouraging fragmentation and encouraging cluster development. So I'll just posit that if you have additional thought on intent for this broadly, before I get into the rest of what they have to do, what is the, what is the intent in enacting a direction for rules related to forest blocks and habitat connectors. So this is what the House felt was their intent. Discourage fragmentation, encourage clustering, and then I'm going to talk about the other many things that are involved here, because it's a few pages, it's multiple pages. Yeah. So I'll, and we, that is part of the intent as well, but, all right. Back to line three. Uh, so the rules adopted by the board shall include, so there's a shall there, how forest block and habitat connectors are further defined, including their size, location, and function, which may include information that will be available to the public to determine where forest blocks and habitat connectors are located, or advisory mapping resources, how they will be made available, how they will be used, and how they will be updated. Standards establishing how impacts can be avoided or minimized, including how fragmentation of forest blocks or habitat connectors is avoided or minimized which may include steps to promote proactive site design of buildings, roadways, and driveways, utility locations, and location relative to existing features such as roads, tree lines, and fence lines. So I'm gonna pause there for a second. This language has been gone through many iterations. We've talked about this previously in previous sessions. The language that's in subdivision two at one point was considered for inclusion of the statute, a sort of clear directive of things for applicants to just to consider. It's being added here as things to be addressed in the rules, so the site design elements. Um, and then next is the definition of fragmentation. This is a this is a definition in the session law provision of rulemaking for rulemaking. So as used in this section, fragmentation generally means dividing land that is naturally occurring that has naturally occurring vegetation and ecological processes into smaller areas as a result of land uses that remove vegetation and create physical barriers that limit species movement and interrupt ecological processes between previously connected natural vegetation. However, the rule shall further define fragmentation for purposes of avoiding, minimizing, and mitigating under undue adverse impacts on forest blocks and habitat connectors. Fragmentation does not include the division or conversion of a horse block or habitat connector 
by an improved <laughs> recreational trail, or by improvements constructed for farming, logging, and forestry purposes below the elevation of 2,500 feet. Um, as used in this subsection, recreational trails the same meaning as trails in section 442. So this is another kind of awkward thing, but the other versions of criteria of the new forest block habitat connector criterion use the word fragmentation. It is not using that word, but the rulemaking section uses the word fragmentation quite a bit. So the criterion itself contemplates things beyond fragmentation, undue adverse impacts on the forest block or habitat connected themselves, could include forest fragmentation. It could include other things as well. And then there is this inclusion of a definition of fragmentation, a direction to further define it for purposes of this rule. So, Senator Watson, I don't know if I got to your question in there. Well, I think that I am um, having put the whole paragraph together, it helps. Because it's, it's this, but also that. Yeah. And okay. Yeah. All right, on page 39, line seven. Criteria to so the rule shall include criteria to identify the circumstances when a forest block for habitat connector. Habitat connectors are is eligible for mitigation. As part of this, the criteria shall identify the circumstances when the function, value, unique sensitivity, or location of a forest block or habitat connector would not allow mitigation. Standards for how impacts of a forest block or habitat connector may be mitigated. Standards may include appropriate ratios for compensation, appropriate forms of compensation, such as conservation easements, fee interest in land, and other forms of compensation, and appropriate uses of on-site and off-site mitigation. The board shall convene a working group of stakeholders to provide input to the rule prior to pre-filing with ICAR. The board shall convene the working group on or for July 1, 2025. The board shall file a final proposed rule with the Secretary of State and LCAR on or before June 15th of 2026. So it's asking the board to convene a working group to address all of these various issues of the rulemaking both on or before July 1, 2025. The new board is set to be stood up July 1, 2025. If the current board wants to start working on it now, they could. Um, but the rule itself isn't due to LCAR until 2026. So a full year, almost a full year with the working group. And then another, they can start earlier than that if they want. Okay. So uh, in terms of trying to manage development and avoid fragmentation, absent until this work is completed, um, we would have things at 26, well, then it's got to be in effect. Um, is there any current law that addresses fragmentation in order to uh, try to minimize it? Just trying to remember if we have something else operative or if previous attempts to address fragmentation have not made it all through the next. Correct. Yeah. Other this language has been vetoed multiple times. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, not, perhaps not this identical language, but in terms of this. So um yeah, I Act 250 uh doesn't have a does not have this specific of a criteria currently. There you go. That's okay. Um the um 39 line six definition of recreation trail 442 is um we need to say with that section it's 442. True, that's um the definition of recreational trail in the Vermont Trails system statute. Thank you. Um and it is the uh uh yeah. Thank you. Um Else, right? So, 
22, section 22. Section 22 is language that's been kicking around for a long time. It directs a &R to add source block and contact connectors to their gas. Um, so I think I've reviewed this identical language many times in this committee. So the Secretary of Natural Resources shall complete and maintain resource mapping based on GIS or other technology. The mapping shall identify natural resources throughout the state, including forest blocks and habitat connectors that may be relevant to the consideration of energy projects and projects subject to Chapter 151, which is Act 250. <laughs> The Center for Geographic Information shall be available to provide assistance to the Secretary in carrying out the resource mapping. <clears throat> Secretary shall consider resource maps developed under the section on providing evidence and recommendations to the PUC under Section 248, and when, rec and when commenting or providing recommendations under Act 250 to district commissions on other projects. <clears throat> the Secretary shall establish and maintain written procedures that include the process and science-based criteria for updating the resource maps developed in the subsection A. Before establishing and revising these procedures, the secretary may uh, shall provide opportunities for affected parties and the public to submit relevant information and recommendations. So obviously, ANR already does uh, maintain and update their resource atlas and their mapping resources. But this is specifically requiring that forest blocks and habitat connectors be mapped on them. <clears throat> On page 41, section 23, the next couple of sections are a little bit of a grab bag <clears throat> section. So section 41, uh, so on page 41, section 23 is um, updating the section on primary agricultural soil mitigation. So it's adding new language that says, wood products manufacturers, notwithstanding any other provision of this chapter to the contrary, a conversion of primary agricultural soils by a wood products manufacturer shall be allowed to pay a mitigation fee computed according to the provisions of subdivision one of this section, except that it shall be entitled to a ratio of one to one protected areas, protected acres to acres of affected primary agricultural soils. So currently under Act 250, criteria 9B, if a project is going to convert or significantly imperil primary agricultural soils, they have to mitigate that harm to the soils. Um, and it is an avoid, minimize, mitigate standard. They have to first seek to avoid that damage, um, then minimize it. And then if they can't fully minimize it, they have the ability to mitigate it. There are two forms of mitigation. There's on-site mitigation, and there's off-site mitigation. In either instance, more acres need to be protected than are being affected. And there is a formula in statute for calculating how much soil, how many acres of soil need to be protected. And it is between two to one and three to one. This provision is lowering that specifically for wood products manufacturers so that it is a ratio of one to one. And so if a wood products manufacturer is seeking to um, construct a project on 10 acres and two acres of that site have primary cultural soils that would be negatively impacted, they will be able to protect two acres as opposed to between four and six acres. And this was a so when A and R came in and I have a little note that says A and R loves this section on my on my bit. Was this an amendment that came to the floor or was this in the original bill? This was added by the committee. It was not a floor amendment. It was not. Okay. So this is giving some special treatment to wood product manufacturers. It is still requiring that they do um, mitigation, but it is at a lesser amount than other businesses would have to. Based on the business, not the soil. Yes. 
between protecting businesses and so businesses. You can find that part in there. Well, just in case people are trying to follow, but sort of the back story has been that as the wood products industry is struggling to pay by, could we do something that would make it less challenging for them to um, stay in business, uh, make it less costly for them to make the to the facility? And that I think was uh, the rationale I heard my arguing for it. Saying in case someone didn't know what your question was, so, yeah, it was easy. I was being a Costco uh, advertisement, oh. in which it referred to lawn chairs that were made with plastic lumber. <laughs> Thank you for the gravel. Okay, you too. An observation from the field advertising in the forest. You want to? The forest of quest and hope. Um, Ms. Hanko, Mr. Gill, would you like to? I'm happy, happy to chime in there on that discussion if you'd like. Um, Pete Gill, uh, Executive Director for the Natural Resources Board. Just two things. One is um, the one to one ratio. Uh, was something that came out of our uh, study uh, with multiple uh, stakeholders. Uh, the other important piece, I think, to the argument and probably why there was widespread agreement on that consensus point was that um, these working lands are important. This was a was a look at keeping those working lands working um, and open in that in that way. Um, and I'll also just note. Really briefly, the one to one is also available for uh, projects in the technical part, so it's kind of a, a mirror to that uh, existing one. Thank you. Okay, so let's keep going. 23. If there's unless there are other questions about this. So 23A and 23B were floor amendments. All right. So we are going to take a quick detour to something not entirely active, but do related. Um, accessory on farm businesses. So section 23A is amending the definition of accessory on farm business that currently appeals in chapter 117 and plan 24. Um, I think you have had hearings on accessory on farm business this session. It's been a while. Um, and I haven't been here on it, I don't think, but currently, um, this, and um, so stop me if you, if this is too in-depth of an explanation. Currently, there is this concept in the municipal zoning chapter called accessory on-farm business. It was enacted in 2018, and it provides that the municipality cannot, through their zoning, prohibit accessory on-farm businesses, and then it goes on to define what those businesses are. Uh, it allows the municipality to still have some site plan review authority over them, so they have some basic, the ability to have some basic um, permitting on these sites, so they cannot fully prohibit them. And so, um, so there are two big categories of accessory on farm business. There are the uh, storage preparation, processing, and sale of agricultural products, so called qualifying products, which we will get to in a minute. And then there are uh, recreational, social, and um, educational events on the farm. So this section is changing the definition of what is included in accessory on-farm business. So on page 42, accessory on-farm business means activity on a farm, the revenues of which may exceed the revenues of the farming operation. So this is the first change. It's striking the word accessory. And then also, um, currently that has been interpreted to mean subordinate to the farming operation. So these accessory businesses have been required to be generating less revenue than the farming itself. 
And now this is allowing the revenues may exceed the revenues of the farming operation. And comprises one or more of the one or both of the following: the storage, preparation, processing, and sale of qualifying products, provided that the products are produced on a farm. The sale of products that name, describe, or promote the farm or accessory on farm business, including merchandise or apparel that features the farm or accessory on farm business, or the sale of bread or baked food baked in the state. So, so it is striking the requirement that currently, in order to qualify for this um, uh, program project, um, it has to be at least 50% of the total annual sales are to come from that farm. So it's getting rid of that qualification. And now one of these businesses can do storage preparation, processing, and sale of farm products so long as they were produced on a farm in the state. There is no requirement that any of the products come from that farm specifically. It is also extending that they can sell merchandise and baked goods and bread baked in the state. So I do want to flag that include the inclusion of the phrase in the state at the end there with the baked goods is a little bit of a flag of a potential violation of the dormant commerce clause. Um, now, there are arguments to uh, for and against the strength of the constitutionality issue here. The Dormant Commerce Clause requires that you can't have an, an economic protectionist attitude that would protect an attitude or statement in the law that protects in-state businesses over out-of-state businesses. So here, you're allowing that these businesses can sell baked goods, baked in the state, not baked goods, not baked, baked goods, not baked in the state. So it's a flag there. There are some, the counter argument to that is um, food safety, <laughs> but unclear how much actual oversight there are here for baked goods, baked in the state. So um, it's a little murky, a little, Concern, I have a little concern here about the constitutionality of that last clause. Um, the ingredients in the bread or baked goods need not originate in Vermont. Correct. So the only thing that makes them Vermont is they were baked here, not grown here. Or yeah. Or 20 blackbirds. <laughs> um, so if I just to sort of push this to an extreme to make sure I see what's going on. If I had a farm and I were raising a crop and then I could build a facility that would process um, all, all these other products from a farms elsewhere in the state, like a phase of freeze, uh, a flash freeze vegetable thing. We're going to freeze them, package them, etc. Um, I could have ninety nine percent of my income come out of running this food prep factory on my farm, and I'm no longer bound by any. Um, I'm free of an, an obligation to be reviewed by a minister. So you're not wholly reviewed, uh, you're not wholly free. The municipality maintains the ability to do site plan review, which is a lesser form of review than the than the full municipal land use permit. Um, so the kind of, I've seen processing issues come up before. Um, can I build a parking lot of a certain size and lights that might run all night and and I have refrigerator trucks backed up waiting to load and they keep their refrigeration units running all night and none of this will be subject to a review by butter. So site plan review allows the town to look at traffic, lighting, signage, parking. Noise? No. Uh, it may, Noise may be able to be reviewed as part of traffic itself, but it is a limited subset of criteria that a site plan review can review. 
So I'm just because of a suit that happened in Madison County like 15 years, 20 years ago, it was an apple orchard. They started processing more and more material. They would have trucks come that would sit idling overnight, um, ready to load in the morning, you know, take off. And between the lights and the idling trucks, it was a, it changed the nature of the neighborhood for the people living next to the orchard. It changed part of the law. I don't know. I remember, I think actually the orchard may have prevailed. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't even, I'm not going to worry about it. I haven't sorted out exactly, but just that. It's If it's when someone lives next to the farm, they may expect certain things to happen. Someone lives next to sort of a food factory, that might be quite just a thing. Even if in the overall state's interest, we might say, what a great thing. It's all part of the value added. Arms will play um, ecosystem. That's coming to the nuisance or having a nuisance to arrive on the farm and people and the neighbors. Right? Yes. yes. Um, you're reminding me of dramatic phrases from the past coming to the nuisance or the nuisance coming to the um, Senator White. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll just flag, and I'll probably include this in my email. This is a section that I have some questions and concerns about. I have a question for council, and then like a general question. I don't know if it would be you. So my first question is, um, S-286 that um, Senator Starr introduced, is this just that? No. Okay. Do you have any understanding of the differences between them, or should I just go and compare? Um, I haven't reviewed it in a while, but I'm pretty sure Senator Stars will only change with one word. Yeah. Words. This, but, is, this is on a different topic. I don't think I will take a comment. Oh, okay. So it's not just okay. Um, I would love if we had a conversation related to S two eighty six with this section. That was, we have that was about principally producing mm -hmm. farm. Yeah. Oh, so this. If you had to be 51, then there would be more. Than that. This is more related than. Yeah, I think I, so, but I haven't reviewed it recently. Okay. Um, okay. And then my other question, and I'm not sure if it's you or who would be able to answer it, but we have a growing number of uh, farm related businesses in our area that. Uh, seem to primarily get their income, and I don't know if they get designations or not, but they get it from concerts um, and uh, like hosting uh, like writers or me, you know, they, they are actually kind of like a retreat center that happens to have some sheep. Um, and I'm just wondering kind of right now, I'm just nervous about that because I love those businesses. I go to many of the events, but it feels like the regulatory environment for them as a business would be very different under this regime than what we currently have. So could you just walk me through what a municipality would in total be able to review? Um, and I'm thinking about like concerts and music and that kind of thing. Sure. So for so because this statute is only for towns with municipal zoning, towns that don't have zoning, the the oh right. yeah. So it was how to go through. So like a town, well, but if the town doesn't have zoning, they're not doing review anyways, which is how some of these farm projects come about because there isn't necessarily direct oversight of what they're doing. Um so Currently, the the part of the statute that isn't shown here is uh, isn't being shown here because it is not being amended in this section. But they still the for accessory on farm businesses to qualify for this limited regulation by the municipality. Um, events have to be educational, recreational, or social, and they have to feature the agricultural practices or products from that farm. Oh, so and, you so you. Can I have an example? If you host, let's say every Wednesday, you host an outdoor concert series, you would just be able to have music. You'd have to have like a farm demonstration at the same time. Or could you just have music and you're like, hey, people are at the farm. They're seeing the farm. No, there's supposed to be uh, a 
a clear connection to the practices of the farm. Okay, so like it, it's pretty classic. We're trying to make sure old holiday type stuff happens. Is that kind of the? Sure, mm -hmm. I'm not super familiar with that. Uh, if you ever, I, I'll, I can talk for hours about old home day, but um, okay. I'm going to the Tunbridge World's Fair and they have <laughs> agricultural practice okay. classes of life. So it'll be that. Okay. Thank you. That helps. Um, is this, we want to see it in context. It's, yes. Is it 24, 44, 12? Yes. It'll be that. Okay. Um, and you said it's sort of site review. Yeah, but the term of art, and then we could read what that entails. Sure, I mean, I already read you the partial list. I missed one. So the town is allowed to review the adequacy of parking, traffic access, circulation of pedestrians and vehicles, landscaping and screening, protection of the utilization of renewable energy resources, exterior lighting, signage, and then other matters if they adopt specific uh, bylaws on it. So, so in performance standards. So it is a much shorter list of things <laughs> that the full municipal land use permit would review for. Okay. And um, did you say uh, concerts? So you're talking about having concerts, weddings, that sort of thing. Yeah. They're allowed not to work. Where are they in this mix? Yeah, say weddings out loud. Jeez. Um, yeah. So listen, this is a complicated area of statute that has been debated, and there is actually very little case law interpreting it. Uh, the statute's only been around for five years. So um, this statute was designed to have businesses that directly related to the farming. And so there is an argument that some of these other events, if they feature agricultural products and products and practices, they could happen under this umbrella. However, for some of those types of events, it is difficult to make such a causal connection. So, um, but the original intent of the committee was so that we're giving free reign to just event spaces so because generally event spaces and venues have to get all their permits. That's kind of where I'm. I have a um, I don't want to pose as a scholar here. I have not done peer reviewed historical research on this, but my understanding is that the Agricultural exemption in Act 250 was purely, going back to 1970, was purely political. It was a matter of getting the agricultural caucus, getting the votes of legislators who are watching out for the interests of them. And it was a deal. It's a deal that could be defended in terms of considering that land that is in agriculture is generally not getting developed. Um, you know, the, the, the beautiful countryside I'm trying to say is an agricultural uh, uh, countryside. So it was never, as far as I know, there was never an argument made that um, agriculture was any less problematic with the environment. And other uses. Like, as far as I know, that was never suggested. There were the argument is made farmers are stewards of the land when it's taken, but agriculture has a lot of um, uh, environmental problems as well. And, and and certainly you're not anti-agriculture, you're saying that they they probably all those problems ought to at least be addressed. Uh nevertheless, we have the agricultural exemption, it is not based on the idea that agriculture is less environmentally problematic. It is based on respect for farming as a way of life. And as a way of protecting farming dependence and protect farming as a way of life. Then the question comes, how far from farming can we move and continue the exemption? Certainly a farm with a little lean-to on the side of the highway selling 
vegetables in the summer and well, maple syrup, spring, something. You can say, yeah, that's it. That's part of that. Okay. The farmer wants to uh, open up gravel bit. And is that agriculture? Well, the benefit, the economic benefit of the gravel bed will support the economics of the farm. So you can make that argument. Or you can say, it's not agriculture, it's a gravel bed. <laughs> and that's when you're getting into that, that gray area. When <laughs> I was a younger man. I made my living with my guitar. Part of that time was in bars in New York City. And every bar I worked in had in a little kitchen, a big pot. Usually it was a piece of because it doesn't go bad that way. But <laughs> and as it got thicker and thicker, they just add water. Because New York law well, was you were not allowed to sell alcohol unless you were a restaurant. Okay. At what point does agricultural this is agriculture terms. I was an agricultural exemption. At what point does that not pass the straight face test? Okay, because we have wedding barns and they're barns that no self respecting crowd would set foot in. <laughs> you don't want to get married in a real barn. Mm -hmm. A barn is the last place you want to get married. You hear your name too long. Yeah. But also, it doesn't smell good. <laughs> I mean, it's a, Real, so I, I we have to find if we're going to continue the, the exemption, and obviously, we are as a political reality, no one has ever seriously suggested to the way to do Then, what we're going to do is at least have it said we're in trouble. And uh, I think there are claims, uh, including in our county in Windsor County, claims that this is agriculture that really. I notice when someone makes that claim, they avert their lives. <laughs> avert their lives. They're, they're, the people who make that claim are embarrassed. <laughs> so, I mean, we have, uh, at least since I got here, because of, you know, companies at the time that we had record low milk prices, uh, had programs to help people diversify their income. <laughs> Wood blocks, they had to get into it. They had no. And then we started doing more and more things to help them diversify the income, value added, uh, some processing of the farms here, some milkers, using high quality cheese. Uh, all good things, but I don't know what you say. How far do you go from the original farm territory to when the farm operation itself is a um, very modest portion of? The overall business out there. Yes. It's an extra century. Um, Mr. Chair, just I are you, I don't know if you were talking about all the sections as one, but 23B when we get there. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I didn't get there. That's one that might help alleviate some of my concerns, but I don't fully understand what it does. So yeah. So there's one other change on page 42, and I just want to flag, I don't necessarily understand the full applications of it. So on page 42, line 12, so qualifying product is a defined term that's used throughout. And so qualifying product is a product that is, and it's changing from wholly to principally. So wholly is all, principally is mostly, probably 51%. And then it goes on to say these lists of things that are what you think of as things grown or raised on a farm. Um, and so here, what that would mean in context is an accessory on farm business means the sale of products that are principally an agricultural product. So mostly. So it suggests to me something slightly farther removed. I, I, adverbs in general are tricky in statute. Um, and so the statute has thus far been wholly, so all of it has to have been grown or raised on a farm. This is modifying that. Um, so I'm not sure I understand fully what the implications of that are, but it suggests that it's lesser percentage of the crop or meat needs to come from that. 
Do you want to? Wait, in 286, we talked a lot about shepherd's pie. That is so good. Multiple ingredients and something came from the farm, something didn't. So combining that, though, with the additional changes in this language. So shepherd's pie, that was 51% produced. Either on farm or in the statement would be a qualified product. Natural or okay. I don't know. I mean, that is a kind of And I'm saying I, I don't. You know, you know, uh, pro probably. Okay, probably. Hold on. Okay. So yeah, you got the meat, the potatoes from that location, but you got or, or, uh, That was the main. Okay. You, you, all the ingredients have originally been in the state. Bring it up. Well, so that is part of my a little confusion here is that we're talking about a qualifying product means a product that is, and we can just go like uh pick one of them, like a, well, how about five? It's like, yeah, so five is like a big yeah, catch all, but it's also modified, it's multiple things. Yeah, but so like I'm gonna start with a simpler example of like um uh, poultry. So a qualifying product means a product that is mostly poultry, a product of poultry. So uh, an accessory off our business can store, for, store, storage, store, prepare, process, or sale, sell a product of poultry, provided that it was produced on a farm. And on the farm, the Vermont farm? Or yes. It means a farm that is regulated by the required agricultural practices. So that is the Vermont farm. Sure. But are we talking about the product of poultry would be just a part, like a wing? <laughs> or are we talking about soup? Because we're talking about principally a part of poultry. So it, it may be partially something else, yeah. like a pot pie. I just, I am a little bit confused about what exactly principally means in this, combined with the other changes. Okay. Um, well, and so the only, is there a body of law or rulings or permitting that we can look at that spell about how this is being interpreted? I mean, we do it, it's shifting from 100% to 51% or more. Um, but at least that's my understanding. Um, but we, must have experienced that applying these criteria. Okay. The statute is only five years old. Okay. Hmm. So, anyways, right. this is a lot of therapy. This yeah, yeah, well, Beth, yeah. I've got flagged these. As I've gone through, they're my yellows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so then we should get to page 43. So, section 23B is now adding. An Act 250 exemption for these businesses. And so currently, under Act 250, accessory on farm businesses are not exempt. However, there is overlap between what is defined as farming under Act 250, and so is therefore exempt, and what is an accessory on farm business. And this is, I think, a conversation that needs to be had with. The Natural Resources Board and the Agency of Agriculture to make sure that we have this all lined up correctly because currently farming is exempt from Act 250. And farming includes the things that you do think of, which is the growing or raising of things, but it also includes the on-site storage, preparation, or sale and sale of agricultural products principally produced on farms. So many farm stands fall into the category of sale of products principally produced on a farm, and so are therefore already exempt. The difference here being the word in this statute, Act 250, is principally produced, which is the 51% from that farm. So 51% uh, needs to come from that farm, and um, so this concept with the farm stand now under um, this concept in this uh, bill 
These farm stands have a broader um, ability to sell things because it's not they're not being bound by selling things grown on their farm. So that is sort of the distinction. If currently they're active 50, you're selling 50% of the things that you sell or grown or raised on your farm, or you sell back to it for your farm stand. This is now allowing selling, if the majority of good products do not come from your own farm, to be exact right. So on page 43, no permit or permit amendment is required for the construction of improvements for an accessory on farm business for the storage or sale of qualifying products or the other eligible enumerated, enumerated, enumerated products in 44, 12, 11, A, Romanet 1, Romanet 1. And so that, so those, uh, it's the t-shirts and the baked goods are those sort of other things. Um, and then no permit or permit amendment is required for the construction of improvements for an accessory on our business for the preparation or processing of qualifying products, provided that more than 50% of the total annual sales of the prepared or processed qualifying products come from products produced on the farm where the business is located. So we're starting in the first sentence with just um, sale, um, and then moving to process it, preparation or processing, as long as it's 50% coming from products grown on the farm. And then this subsection shall not apply to the construction of improvements related to hosting events or farm stays as part of accessory on farm business as defined. So uh, the exemption is not being extended to the second part of the definition regarding the events, which includes farm stays or, or other events. Okay. So there's a lot going on in there. And that, again, was a floor amendment. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Uh, uh, so I'm going to ask to remain in our meeting for the record. When it's appropriate, I can give you a little more feedback, uh, background, excuse me, on how, well, keeping the working lands working, part of our recommendations, and then also our um, AOFP study that we did back in January of 2023, and give you an idea of how this language came to the, you know, came to the Feel like it was more more appropriate than prior. But does the twenty twenty three report offer recommended language? Is I don't more think, concepts. I don't recall that it does, but it it recognizes that there was a disconnect from the municipal law Act one forty three that talked about sales versus Act 50 that talked about weight and volume. And you know, frankly, uh, we're not going out with neighbors and scales and with measuring things. And why can't you sell your neighbor's eggplants and your own blueberries? And blueberries weigh a lot less than eggplants. <laughs> that kind of kind of rationale. And everybody on the committee, you now it was a wide variety of stakeholders, agreed that we should be able to aggregate produce from farms and, and had this opportunity to share your produce and, and, and sell it, et cetera, instead of getting into how much do you do various way. Okay. Um, can I ask you a favor? Can you send to um, is Newman the report? Yes. Just so we make sure that we put it into the record. And yes, absolutely. All right, so yeah, this is a tip of the iceberg conversation. And I don't want to icebergs can shape save great shifts, so let's keep going. And I'll just also yeah. say, and then I'll be quiet, that nobody agreed on the events part of this. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Well, there was very little consensus on the events part of it. It was all about, yes, they should be able to sell okay, produce from other people's farms. But there was very, there was, no, there was not consensus on events. Just and that's why twenty three B happened. Right, and I think um, do restaurants constitute an event? What a great question that is! An ongoing event. I don't. We serve so we have an event every night. It's called dinner. Dinner. <laughs> dinner is at noon. <laughs> 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 I actually think it 
it might qualify as the preparation and sale of qualifying products. No, it is unclear. The test would be that the big meal is served at noon. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, supper in the evening. Well, at least we're talking about chicken pot pie, so we're staying in that direction. All right. So let's leave this one for now, it's knowing that it's a lot. lot under the... Let me do this. So uh, there is such a thing as, as agritourist, oh, sure. and it's legitimate, you know? So you suck in your breath. Let's say something. No, you're great. Oh, oh. I'm, 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 I'm still like reacting to the previous conversation. So it's all good. You're great, Karen. There's some petting zoo, two eggs is <laughs> inside of Hartford, Connecticut. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of complicated. Oh, oh we're going in. Oh, the road rule. Road rule. Let's take place. All right. So at the bottom of page 43 is um, section 24 is the road rule. So uh, just, just as a setup here. This is not actually a rule. This is a statute on Act 250 jurisdiction over road construction. Um, there was for uh, 26 years something called the road rule under Act 250 that established a process for determining jurisdiction over roads as part of Act 250. That language was repealed in 2001 by the legislature. And so this would be sort of a revival of that jurisdictional trigger and putting it in statute. So the language is based fairly closely to what was previously in rule. And there are some modifications. But it is a little bit complicated. Oh, but this committee previously in 2020 spent a long time working on the road rule language. This language is not that language. Okay. It, the house went with its own language. Mm. But I it, it's close. It's it's well, I'll, I can I can we can compare it at some point if you'd like, but this is that version the house went with. So what triggers Act 250? The construction of a road or roads and any associated driveways to provide access to or within a tract of land owned or controlled by a person. For purposes of determining jurisdiction under this subdivision, onto page 44, any new development or subdivision on a parcel of land that will be provided access by the road and associated driveways is land involved in the construction of the road. Jurisdiction under this subdivision shall not apply unless the length of any single road is greater than 800 feet and the lengths of all roads and any associated driveways in combination is greater than 2,000 feet. As used in this subdivision, roads shall include any new road or improvement to a class four road by a private person, including roads that will be transferred to or maintained by a municipality after their construction or improvement. For the purpose of determining the length of any road and associated driveways, the length of all other roads and driveways within the tract of land constructed after July 1, 2026 shall be included. This subdivision shall not apply to a state or municipal road, a utility corridor of an electric transmission or distribution company, a road used primarily for farming or forestry purposes. The conversion of a road used for farming or forestry purposes that also meets the requirements of the subdivision shall constitute development. The subdivision shall not apply to development within a tier one area, tier one A area established in accordance with 10 BSA, we're going to fix that, section 30, 634, or tier one B area in 6033. The intent of the subdivision is to encourage the design of clustered subdivisions and development that does not fragment tier two areas or tier three areas. Okay. So the construction of a private road greater than 800 feet 
where multiple roads greater than 2,000 feet shall trigger Act 250 jurisdiction, and it shall attach to the parcels that are given access to by this road. Okay, so I'm looking at lines four or five of a jurisdiction shall not apply unless um, any single roads greater than 800, got it, length of all roads and associated driveways and combinations greater than 2,000, um, that, and what if all the roads are under 800 feet, but by the time you put them all together, they're over 2,000. It's the end that I'm tripping. Yes, and I agree with you. I'm wondering if it, there should be an or on line four. Yeah. Um, this was VRC's language. Um, I think there's a couple places that can maybe be clarified. Um, but yes, I have been wondering. And so I will say, I think Sabina's going to raise her hand in a minute. Uh, there is a, in, there's a question about intent here on what it is you do want to be the trigger. Because, spoiler, the NRB report just said 2,000 feet. Sure. The committee wanted this uh, single road versus combination of roads. So it's 800 and 2,000. And I will just also remind you that Senate Economic Development had 1,000 and 2,000. Okay. There was it. Thank you. So did the NRB report, um, it just said the 2,000 feet, but that was that a combination for a single road? It was just. Okay. I don't recall. You should. I, I, I phone a friend. Yeah. Combination. 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 And so it didn't have a single road. Didn't have to. Okay. So this a more sensitive trigger might be about we don't it's any single ride eight hundred or longer can trigger a loan, as opposed to combination of roads and driveways without worrying about which thing is a road and which is a driveway at the two thousand. Right, and I think that would reflect some of the trickiness that happened in the original road rule with us that people were getting out of the road rule because they were building driveways. Yeah. Those weren't roads, those were driveways. Okay. And in the original former road rule, did it have the two parts like this or was it, it, it was just 800 feet. It was just 800 feet. And so it, and so it didn't have the combination Aspect. Okay, thank you. Which was part of the issue, is people would build a 790 foot road and then a 700 with is the driveway. Right. Yeah. Oh, I see. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and there were also some cases, unfortunately, I don't know if this would address it, that adjoining parcels might have two very long driveways, sort of side by side. Each one is so jurisdictional. But for a sort of a straight face test, you actually have just built 270, basically 1,600 feet of road, but they were Mars. So I don't, this one doesn't solve that puzzle either. Okay, thank you very much. Any more questions on me? I know there's so, going to be a much bigger conversation. Well, right. So I do want to do two small flags. So something here that's a little unusual is the very last sentence um, is an intent section. So the House Committee spent a long time thinking about how to structure this jurisdictional trigger. And so most active 50 jurisdictional triggers do not have an intent sentence with them. This is sort of uh, creative. And so it is saying that the intent is to encourage design of clustered subdivisions and development to again avoid fragmentation. And so this is similar to the force block criterion in that way. Um, but it's a little unusual, but um, it is interest just an interesting feature. Um uh, and, and naming thing. So it, it is the reader assistance here to the road rule. 
But we're not, there's not room, there's not a rule yeah. making underneath it. No, well, why, well, yes, there is. Well, it's on page 45. I'm 45. Okay. So, yes. And so I tried to call it road construction, and the House Committee was confused where the road rule runs was. So, so this, the rulemaking section I'm calling yeah. road construction rulemaking because. We can't call a statute a rule. It's just, you know, but that's what we all sort of colloquially know it as. So there is a rulemaking provision for this, um, and it's a may. So the NRB may adopt rules providing additional specificity to the necessary elements of the language I just went through, the road. It is, a, it is the intent of the General Assembly that any rules encourage the design of clustered subdivisions and development that does not Fragment tier one, tier two, or tier three areas. Thank you. Um, Ms. Haskell, Mr. Gill, do you want to say anything while we're in this neck of the woods on the bill? You don't have to, I'm just offering a chance to jump in. You like. There's some historical perspective that the road roll is difficult to administer. Uh, as an organization, I just uh, I can't. I I'm not in a position to get into those details, but there are other people who have talked about. I'd be happy to talk about that. It's a difficult rule to enforce. Having said that, we see the goal of having compact settlement be important, and not we want to keep working lands working, and we understand that we need to. I mean, the road roll was part of our consensus recommendation that, you know, for presentation purpose, you know, to avoid. And that. the necessary updates. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The and difficulty administration. So that's the, I mean, so we're talking historically. And if that has something to do with this whole thing we're talking about, when is it a driveway? When is it a road? That kind of thing. That, you know, make for challenging administration. The length of a particular road, when you have a cul de sac or you don't have a cul de sac. For it. Um, are we going out there with our measuring tapes and measuring and et cetera? That's challenging on enforcement level. It's challenging on administration of uh, permitting level. And there was some inconsistency in the way the board decided over the course of those 26 years, just because roads do come in various shapes and sizes. Okay. Based on my research, I would say that was my research interpretation. That's the deal. Keep Sharing. Okay, so on page 45, section 26, location-based jurisdiction, also known as the tiers. Tiers. <laughs> you, you know, you find yourself really drawn to a different nomenclature. So basically, it's committee, but... Really? Is this is your pitch for people joining the net? Yeah, crowdsource, a new name. All right. <laughs> Oh, so section 26 is amending 6001 of Act 250 as the jurisdictional trigger section. And so the new language is on page 46. And so um, line 19, the construction of improvements for commercial, industrial, or residential purpose at uh, in a tier three area as determined by the rules adopted by the board. So um, this is what came out of the house. Uh, we'll talk about tier three of, in a more in a minute, but this is actually very similar to what came out of said economic development. So on page 47, tier two means an area that is not tier one or tier three. Tier three, means an area consisting of critical natural resources, which may include river, river corridors, headwater streams, habitat connectors of statewide significance, and as may be further defined by the board. Right, so we have a whole conversation about priming the pump when the secretary is in. Anyway. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this, this kind of 
gets to exactly my point, and I did have a good conversation with Secretary Moore following um, when we adjourned. Um, so this may include, so we could kind of get to my point, we could say shall, yes, that's one change possibly. Um, I'm wondering if you could, so what Secretary Moore and I discussed in part was that there are areas that we can't really develop now just because of their significance with a &R permitting, like separate from any conversation with Act 250. And I would like, if possible, within the Tier 3 rulemaking to kind of call those out already and be like, those are Tier 3. Um, do you... But is this list like kind of all encompassing of those types of development or are there other examples that aren't in here? Uh, well, wetlands comes to mind. Uh, it was kind of heading to wetlands. Right. I mean, <laughs> so the house went through many iterations of this list. Okay. Um, I don't work on water issues. So I, I was gonna say class A, but I don't even know if that's the right Phrase, but the high, whatever they are, there, there are, there are high quality waters, and I don't know a ton off the top of my head about that. Um, I will say that the May gives me pause legally, um, because I agree. I, I think that they could opt to not include those things in the definition of tier three. Mm -hmm. And while it does say an area consisting of critical natural resources. There isn't a lot of definition there. And so as I mentioned with S311, if you're going to delegate rulemaking authority, which does happen in the next section, there needs to be specificity so that the agency knows what it is the rules are supposed to encompass and address. And so I'll walk you through the language in the next section, and there are some Specifics in it, but this definition is pretty is very vague. And so, quick question on critical resource areas: Is this a term we've used before or defined elsewhere? No, it is neither. So it is natural resources that are critical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The empty grids. And so there is some direction in. The, the next section about this, but I do think it is a good idea legally to be more specific so that the agency has standards under the an umbrella under which they can start their investigation and develop these rules, because then they will go back to Elgar, which will then need to look at the legislative intent and say, well, the legislative intent here, at least, and there is, I did include some more in that language, but here is, is quite vague, and so if they were to say, oh, well, only one acre in the whole state is critical. Would that meet your legislative intent? The tip of camel's hump is critical. Right. So just to think about that. <laughs> Sorry, I lost. OK, listen, I have another one. <laughs> oh, in a different <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm getting excited. Yeah. Those critical. Yeah. <laughs> um, All right. I, and sorry. So, Senator White, yes. what part of the conversation I thought I heard you starting to have not out of the room? Yeah. Where do these, like, where are the transitions? Like, where are you leaving? How do you define the boundary? Yes. And things like that. And, and that was, I think, the most difficult part of where we will be able to find right. agreements or agreement is where is the distance from the critical area that counts? Like, is it just up to the water's edge? Is it 100 feet from the water's edge? Is it two miles from the water's edge? Like, where is that? I don't have a strong position that I feel is correct on that question, but my main concern is that we will end up having whatever processes for setting the tiers through rulemaking where we are being more subjective than objective uh, in our decisions. So uh, 
I, I don't, it, Secretary Moore and I, we had a good conversation, but I don't think she came to, we came to any kind of like, this was the right direction. Um, the other thing too, when we talked about a little bit here, before you tell me, we the term river corridor. Uh, we were talking about that in 2013, and I don't know, I haven't seen what they, what we need to get done, but I would think we, we want to be seeking up a yeah. river corridor definition and rulemaking yeah. with the peers here so that they're mutually supportive or compatible or complementary, or they refer to each other the way so that they're consistent with yeah. and don't create administrative problems for the others. Um, so I did just want to add, uh, H687 as introduced, I believe, originally had a, well, it had a different language, but originally said um, construction within or within 25 feet of a critical resource area. That was, it was a lot more specific and it had a, a longer list of sort of natural resources to be uh, looked at. So that was a, a buffer area like you're talking about um, because we are largely talking about construction here. Um, this language is pretty it's just more big. So where is that language? That was an as introduced as it, I think, but I had over time, yeah, it was sort of yes. okay. Change, yeah. um, changes in language occur in the committee process. <laughs> so next is the tier three rulemaking. Um so the board, in consultation with the Secretary of Natural Resources, shall adopt rules to implement the requirements for the administration of um, the Tier 3 areas and the Tier 3 definition. The board shall review the definition of Tier 3 area and its use in Act 250 and recommend any additional significant natural resources that should be added to the definition. It is the intent of the General Assembly that these rules address the protection of critical natural resources. So there's the intent section again. Rules adopted by the board shall include any necessary clarifications to how the tier three definition is used in Act 50, any necessary changes to how the jurisdictional trigger should be administered and when jurisdiction should be triggered to protect the functions and values of resources of statewide significance. The process for how tier three areas will be mapped or identified by the Agency of Natural Resources and the board. And on page 48, other policies or programs that shall be developed to review development impacts to tier three areas if they are not included in the definition. A question on mapped or identified line 20 on page 47. Would that include <clears throat> revisions? You know, like once they're defined, someone said, oh, well, we actually should be bigger here, or we should actually be smaller here, or we've changed our mind about something that we want a lot of development there. So, revision, is that a company? I think so. I think the word process okay. covers that. Excuse me. All right, on page 48, on or before uh, January 1, 2025, the board shall convene a working group of stakeholders to provide input to the board prior to pre-filing with IPAR. The working group shall include representation from regional planning commissions, environmental groups, science and ecological resource orga research organizations, woodland or forestry organizations, Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, the Vermont Chamber of Commerce, the League of Cities and Towns, the Land Access and Opportunity Board, and other stakeholders such as the Vermont Ski Areas Association, the Department of Taxes, Division of Property Valuation and Review, the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, the Vermont Woodlands Association, and the Professional Logging Contractors of the Northeast. That last clause about other stakeholders was one of the floor uh, amendments. So providing some of the specific stakeholders that may be included in this group. Um, um, 
I'm wondering about uh, when we say that it shall include representation from these different groups. Uh, is uh, so when some of these groups are very specific, right? Like legal cities, uh, housing and conservation board. Uh, but then science and ecological research organizations or woodland and forestry organizations uh, feels a little vague. And I just, I wonder um, who would be assembling that or do we need to be more specific? So the board is directed to convene this working group. Um, the house wanted to be more vague. Okay. And then the floor amendment was to provide some specifics who may be included. Um, if you would like to be specific, you can. Um, who's Haskell? Um, Spine Haskell, the NRB. Just to sort of flesh that out for you, when we did our report over the summer, we reached out to an enormous amount of um, stakeholder groups, and there were there were groups that just said, you know, we don't have the time or the resources to participate, but this one will and be part of our, you know, they'll let us know what's going on and, and speak for us if we will. And then we had smaller focus groups, so when they could join, that they could. So you're anticipating something similar? It worked very well. Okay. Yeah, and sometimes in the case of the NRC, for instance, we reached out to CLF and the Trust, Vermont, and et cetera, and Audubon, and they, went, they were happy to have the, the NRC be able to, to represent their viewpoints. That's all for Okay, so you don't feel like it needs to be more specific? I, I don't. Okay. Yeah, and we and we did a we did a polling of lots of people. Thank you. <laughs> All right, the board shall file a final proposed rule with uh, Secretary of State and LCAR on or before February 1, 2026. During the rule development, the stakeholder group established under subsection B of this section shall solicit participation from representatives of municipalities and landowners that host tier three critical natural re uh, critical resource areas on their properties to determine the responsibilities and education needed to understand, manage, and interact with these resources. So that subsection D was also a floor amendment. A confer thing. All right. Uh, just so I can understand. So D subsection D was the floor amendment. What? Uh, who did it, the floor amendment? Representative Buss and Lipsky. Oh, and it okay. was with that. It's a, it's was attached to that uh, lines eleven through fourteen, where they were looking for additional specificity on basically areas that or professions that would be potentially impacted. So, you know, loggers and ski areas, and then also they want. So their intent there was to make sure there was some direct outreach to towns and landowners, some outreach for, to towns and landowners about the education of what was happening. Okay. And uh, just so I understand, um, does that, what does that look like? Typically. Um, well, this is a little bit unusual. Like, like would it be, go like my only, my concern is I worry that this sets us up for, I mean, this could be a tremendous amount of work. Um, and while I respect, I'm gonna have to talk to Representative Bus because she is our in our district. Um, I have some sensitivity to the idea that we would go to like every ski area and speak to them about potentially changes to Act 250 and that could create a lot of concern unnecessarily. So I'm, I, I guess, did they, is there a program or an example that is similar to this? Like I know we talked about the Lakeshore work that was done many years ago. Like is that, did A&R speak to what they would be envisioning here? Um, 
Well, so it does say the stakeholder group shall solicitation so solicit participation from representatives of. So they're not necessarily required to go to every single. There isn't like necessarily direct notice to anyone who okay. has right. a forest block on their property yeah. or a river corridor. Um, no, I. Again, I don't. I don't work on Lakeshore or anything water related, so I don't know if I have a few examples on. But I do find this to be a little bit unusual, but this is intended to be a rulemaking process with a lot of public engagement because it will be substantial. <laughs> so this is just adding more. Okay, I'll talk to her. Seems, I'm not sure how it's different than yeah. B, feels like in B, you would have the conversations that D also talks about. But, but if it makes them feel comfortable. Right, but it, it, as you pointed out, what you, you wouldn't want to overwhelm the rulemaking process, so it, um, which is already challenging. Um, Chair Haskell, you have something you want to chip in, or Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, we would, uh, we would certainly reach out to individual landowners and within those associations, I mean, assuming there will be individuals that also are landowners that have that uh, property impacted as well. So, I mean, what does seem different, unique, deep, is this bit about responsibilities and education needed to understand, manage, and interact resources. If you own property, critical free resource, it's identified as a critical resource area. What does that do to your ownership? I mean, um, before we go on to 28, I have a quick question. Sorry to go backwards. Lines one through three, top of 48. So, other policies. So, we were doing rulemaking. And then the last thing is policies or programs developed to review development impacts in two or three areas that they're not included in 6146. So, is this 6146 being critical? Uh, tier three areas. Yeah. We're saying. So um trying to remember. Like it's around that boundary thing that we're just talking about. If it's not in it, but uh, I'm not sure what that looks like. You can also imagine um, it's something to think about, like if you're gonna develop. How sharp are the boundaries? What happens just over the line? It's like in part of that aggressive. Um, I trying to remember. I do not remember. I have a inkling. It could relate to two thirteen as two thirteen. Thank you. Because the definition of two three had changed multiple times during this process. Um. And you're you were working on that bill. I still don't totally know how this bill and 213 lines up, but there potentially is some overlap. That's a 228. Oh, very exciting. 28. Here we go. <laughs> this is um tier one. So first, uh, okay. All right, so tier one, now we're getting into the areas that are more developed areas. So tier three are critical natural resources. Tier one is the opposite end of that spectrum. These are developed areas with some land use regulation. So section 6033 is adding new language for regional plan, future land use maps review. The board shall review requests from regional planning commissions to approve or disapprove portions of future land use maps for the purposes of changing jurisdictional trigger thresholds under this chapter by identifying areas on future land use maps for tier 1B area status and to approve designations pursuant to chapter 139 of Title 24. And so this section is now bringing all three of the reports together in synergy. 
So it is giving the board authority to review regional plans and their maps, which will be used to designate Tier 1 B areas under Act 250 and approve the new designations under Chapter 139. So it's incorporating the Act 250 exemptions that will be associated with Tier 1 B that came out of the Part 250 report, taking VAPTA's report on how to update regional plan review, and then the updated designation process. Um. One, chapter one, I'm sorry, chapter 139. It's brand new. You've never seen it. It's going to be the new designations. Okay. It will be replacing chapter 76A, which is where we currently have the designations for the downtowns, village centers, etc. We're getting a new chapter, chapter 139. Mm -hmm. And we will get to all of this. It's the other 100 pages, 80 pages of this bill, and the details of all this. So the board may produce guidelines for regional planning commissions seeking Tier 1B area status. If requested by the regional planning commission, the board shall complete this uh, review, shall complete review, shall complete this review concurrently with regional plan approval. A request for Tier 1B area status made by a Regional Planning Commission separate from Regional plan approval should follow the process set forth in 24 BSA 43-48. So the board shall review the portions of the future land use maps that include downtown or village centers, planned growth areas, and village areas to ensure they meet the requirements of 24 BSA 5803 and 5804 for designation as downtown and village centers and neighborhood development areas. Okay, so this subsection B refers to the new designated areas. They are downtown and village centers and neighborhood areas. And so you will see in the last sort of segment of this bill, designation, those new designations, the initial designations of them will happen automatically at the ERV, when the regional plan, so when the regional planning commission submits their updated regional plans, if the board approves them, the new designations happen automatically. Uh, to obtain Tier One B area status, under this section, the regional planning commission shall demonstrate to the board that the municipalities with Tier One B areas meet the following requirements as included in 4348A12C. So to be a tier 1B, it has to, the municipality has to have requested the area mapped for tier 1B. So the municipality has to affirmatively ask for it. They, they have to want it. The municipality has duly adopted an approved plan and a planning process that is confirmed in accordance with 24 BSA 4350. The municipality has permanent Zoning and subdivision bylaws in accordance with 4412, 4418, 4442. The area excludes identified flood hazard and fluvial erosion areas, except those areas containing pre existing development in areas suitable for infill development as defined in the Vermont Flood Hazard Area and River Corridor Rule, unless the municipality has adopted flood mm -hmm. hazard and river corridor bylaws applicable to the entire municipality that are consistent with the standards established pursuant to uh, subsection 755B and 1428B of this title. So we're mapping areas that will have a partial Act 250 exemption. And so one of the things to qualify is they either have to exclude their flood hazard and river uh, in fluvial erosion areas, or have adopted flood hazard and river corridor bylaws that comply with the standards and statutes. Uh, thanks, Greg. This goes back to kind of your previous question on S two thirteen. This is the same. Or this is the same. Like the mapping would be the same as we're doing S two fifteen in some respects, right? Like if A and R is mapping, they could probably use the same maps, I assume. 
I don't know if that's what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here are regional plans and their maps. Okay. And so when they go through the process, they are identifying areas that qualify as 1B, which would mean they would be exempt for Act 250. And so they're looking at the areas of the municipal. So I don't think they're doing like specifically river corridor mapping. I'm not sure. I actually don't really know what's in 213 fully, so I don't know if I can address that, but the, new, the regional plan addresses land use areas, okay. and they are to look at these criteria to, to help a town get this partial exemption. Yeah, I think, okay, and that's, I guess, one broader question is, it would be great if we're having mapping happen at the state level, that is identifying the corridors, wetlands, all of that, if it could be used as regional plans are developed to then also look at what is exempt and not exempt, that would be ideal versus potentially multiple different competing maps. Um, and then the reality of, is it exempt from Act 250 or not exempt being like the, being the main decider between if something's developed. So I think we're talking almost about the same thing, but I think, I hope practically it's going to play out that yeah, way. Yeah, that's kind of saying. It's different. A&R has technical expertise on water. Regional planning commissions know their area, the land use and the features, and they do some natural resource mapping, which we will get to. Okay. But I think they base at least part of the, I'm going to stop. We should get a planner. You can hear from a planner on how that will work practically. But I don't I don't think those two things are going to be in competition with each other. Yeah. That's my only concern is I don't want that to be in competition. But I guess we'll last, like. <laughs> but, I mean, it's a good point that we want to be aware. Do use the math efficiently and silo it up and have it be expensive or Thank you. I actually wonder if D is necessary because we're going to be requiring that all municipalities have a floor of, uh, you know, flood hazard area regulations that it's going to be statewide. So is that not, so if, if everybody has that, then why do we need to require it? And, uh, you know, for Exemption, I guess. And then if the state is regulating river corridors for 215, then well, I, I guess I right, I don't know what I'm confused as to what the gain is of this. But maybe it was because this was developed sort of simultaneously. Yeah, I don't I don't know what's in 213 to be perfectly honest. <laughs> I don't know anything about water, and I don't know what is going on. Also, and I mean this with all due respect, right. I write these bills every year, and they get vetoed. Um, so, when we draft, we are planning for the thing in front of us to pass, and we can't always. We we try we can try to coordinate with other bills, yeah. but we at Ledge Council operates that this is the universe that exists. Mm -hmm. And you can't necessarily can't assume until somebody actually passes. <laughs> the law doesn't exist yet. That's true. So it is something to be aware of as this moves forward in the, the legislative session. It um and since both of those bills, I think, will have a delayed effective date. If there is some cross wires, you can fix it. Um, but we do generally operate under the assumption that nothing is real until it is signed. <laughs> That's fair. So we should not assume that 213 is going to make it. And so as a result, maybe we should keep it in and we can deal with it later. Okay. That is, yes, that is fair. Like, that's fair. But um, at some point, I, you know, perhaps I will have to read 213. <laughs> <laughs> it's not If it passes, it does get vetoed. Um, well, and the rulemaking for river quarters completes in 28, I think. So that's fair. So there's um, a lot of time. Like Roadway from here. But it's good to be aware of because I wasn't fully aware of that. Yeah, no, but it's yeah, good to be aware of. Okay. Um so and your committee is better positioned to know and be aware of that than I am because O'Grady and I see each other in the hallway 
and wait. <laughs> but you know, he goes off does the detail. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so still on page 50, the muse, so requirements for tier 1B. The municipality has water supply, wastewater infrastructure, or soils that can accommodate a community system for compact housing development in the area proposed for tier 1B. Or soils that can accommodate a, yeah, that's, okay. Uh, and then finally, municipal staff or contracted capacity adequate to support development review and zoning administration in the community area. So this is the list of things that the Regional Planning Commission will take to the board and say, the municipality has this, do they qualify for Tier 1B? Yes, and if so, they get the Tier, the tier 1B exemption, which we will get to in a later page, the partial exemption just for housing units. Um, the, this list of criteria is sort of the first uh, early sort of list of criteria that will then also be used in Tier 1A. We will get to um, 51 uh, has some more floor amendments, which is why I was confused and in my own head a minute ago. So sections 28A, 28B, and 28C. Um, can I ask a question? So the yeah. floor amendments are good in, in, in this document are the ones, is the section heading with then some A, a B, or a C? That primarily, not yes. Not entirely, but primarily because instead of renumbering the whole bill, just squeeze them in somewhere near where they apply. Um, so these three all relate to extending the sunsets from Act 47, last year's Home Act. So, so Section 28A extends the uh, exemption under Act 250. Um, it was set, it's set to expire July 1, 2026. This is extending it to December 31st, 2026. Um, because if you look at your timeline, in theory, location based jurisdiction would start January 1, 2027. So this would have the sunset for these exemptions ending when the new location based jurisdiction would be taking over. So it's giving a six month exemption to line that up. So first, it's for the um, exemption for 25, for 24 units um, constructed in downtowns, neighborhood development areas, village centers with permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws, growth centers. Um, and so you will recall that currently for housing, um, there it's 10 units or more trigger Act 250. So this is bringing it up to 25 or more units triggering Act 250 in certain designated areas. Section 28B extends the sunset, the additional um, five months for priority housing projects. And so this section removed the cap on the number of priority housing projects that can be exempt under Act 250 during this limited window. And Section 28C is extending the requirement that in order to qualify for either of these exemptions, you need a JO. And so it's extending that from June 30th to December 30th. Okay. Great, thank you. All right, page 52, section 29, tier 1A area status. So this is for the full Act 250 exception. Application and approval. Beginning on January 1, 2026, a municipality, by resolution of its... Sorry. Thank you. Are these... Sorry, the bit that we just did. Uh, is, is this the... Are these the only um, interim exemptions, so to speak, that are baked into this bill? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm just I'm trying to line this up with 311, which has a lot about the exemption, the, the interim exemptions. Yes. These are the interim exemptions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. No. Yes. Yeah. Just wanted to. And so 311 actually strikes all three of these sections and replaces them with higher exemption amounts in a separate section. Okay. Yeah. 
extend those go until 2029. And <laughs> So beginning on January 1, 2026, a municipality, by resolution of its legislative body, may apply to the Environmental Review Board for Tier 1A status for the area of a municipality that is suitable for dense development and meets the requirements of subsection B of this section. The board shall issue an affirmative de determination on finding that the municipality meets the requirements within 45 days after the application is received. Tier 1A area status requirements. To obtain Tier 1A area status near this section, a municipality shall demonstrate to the board that it has each of the following. So these should sound at least somewhat familiar from what I was just reading in Tier 1B, but they are slightly different and it's a much longer list. They have to have a municipal plan approved in accordance with 4358. 4350. Municipal flood hazard planning applicable to the entire municipality in accordance with 43.82.12, and the guidelines issued by the department pursuant to Chapter 139. Flood hazard and bird report or bylaws, applicable to the entire municipality, municipality that are consistent with or stronger than the standards established pursuant to subsection 755B, which is flood hazard areas, and 1428B river corridors, or the proposed tier 1A area excludes the flood hazard areas and river corridor. Um, they have to have a capital budget and program pursuant to 24 BSA 4430 that makes substantial investments in the ongoing development of the tier 1A area, are consistent with the plan's implementation programs, and are consistent with the smart growth principles in chapter 139. <laughs> Permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws that do not include broad exemptions that exclude significant public or private land, uh, private or public land development from requiring a municipal land use permit. Urban form bylaws for the Tier 1A area that further the smart growth principles in chapter uh, of Chapter 139 adequately regulate the physical form and scale of development with reasonable provision for a portion of the areas with sewer and water to allow at least four stories and conform to the guidelines established by the board. On page 54, historic preservation bylaws for established design review districts, historic districts, or historic landmarks pursuant to 4414-1 ENF, for the portion of the Tier 1 area that be the State Historic Preservation Guidelines issued by the Department of Housing and Community Development. Wildlife planning bylaws for the Tier 1A area that protect significant natural communities, rare, threatened, and endangered species, and river corridors, or exclude these areas from the proposed Tier 1A area. Permitted water and wastewater systems with the capacity to support additional development within the Tier 1A area, the municipality shall adopted, have adopted consistent policies by municipal plan and ordinance on the allocation, connection, and extension of water and wastewater lines that include a defined and mapped service area to support the Tier 1A area. Municipal staff adequate to support coordinated, comprehensive, and, co and capital planning, development review, and zoning administration in the Tier 1A area, and the applicable regional plan has been approved by the board. There is a D delegation or D. Can you lose? Is there a provision later on for withdrawing the one A? Yes. And then, okay. As a, as a J, just seems like a little bit of a hard test in that we could have a board, but um, uh, I'm sorry, municipal staff. Uh, so let me talk broadly about what's happening at these two pages. What is happening here is that this is setting up that a, a town can apply to have areas of its town exempt from Act 250. In order to get that area status, they have to meet all of these requirements, most of which are the adoption of bylaws. And bylaws that, is, that line up with the Act 250 criteria. 
So that means then that the municipality would be taking over in some in largely the process that Active 50 currently does, which is reviewing projects for impacts to various environmental and community impacts. So in order to do that, there have to be staff running their development review program. Now it does not specify how many staff, but the town would apply to the board and say, we are a town of 5,000 people. We currently administer a functioning development review program that administers bylaws already. We have sufficient staff to cover this review process and enforce it. Um, and so it is not a specific, there is not anything in the in this statute that is specifying a number because there will be pounds of various size and complexity applying for this. There has to be a demonstration that they have the amount of staff. So are you asking if at some point if they just lose half their staff and can't actually get their permits out and do any kind of review and enforcement? Yeah, there may be an issue that the board would need to review at that point of whether or not they're properly administering this program. Yeah, I, in my short, the reason I ask is because I, having lived in quite a few different towns, I've seen the design review boards, for instance, that were highly functive and others that were more casual and sort of um, you know, out there. Mm -hmm. um, no Thank you. On page 53, uh, this is subsection D, that would call it, um, the capital budget and program that makes substantial investments in the ongoing development of Tier 1A. That was a curious inclusion. Like, why? So we're requiring that a Tier 1A place is making investments in the development of this area. I feel like that's, uh, I'm, uh, I feel like there's a lot of different ways that could look, but it's weird to me that it's a requirement. I'm wondering, I don't know if you know why it was included or if anybody else knows why it's up. So I can tell you, uh, I think this is a policy question for you. Um, this, there is very similar language currently in statute for towns seeking the downtown designation. So if a place is is a designated area, let's say like a downtown, then that, that would count as a place that's being invested in. Yes, they likely already have this kind of thing. Right. I mean, I'm also thinking like tip districts, uh, tax abatements, I mean, not abatements, so tax stabilization. Oh, yeah. Tax stabilization, you know, like that kind of thing as an investment. Oh. That's interesting. Like, yeah. Well, and I, I guess I'm thinking of like yeah. if there's a place that's right for development, but it's not in the tip district, it's not getting you know, um, tax stabilization, and it's not a current downtown or a designated area, are we, is it then inherently excluded? Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's inherently excluded. It is currently on this list of things that the town has to demonstrate that they will have for that area. And so, if they don't, they would not meet right. this requirement. Yep. But they would seek to set it up. Um, you could consider adjusting this list. Um, and I want to come back to that in a second. But okay. I do not actually know a ton about how capital budgeting and planning works. I, guess I, I can think of areas, even in Montpelier, that aren't on any designated map, but are like within walking distance of downtown. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, that would be great for development if, but, but there's not investment happening in that space. Right? Okay, just, just like, yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Senator White. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
And to that point, one of the things that was flagged for us by someone in, in testimony was the cross municipality lines of in some of these situations. And so it really is like if their example was they were in St. Albans City, the growth center they thought went over to St. Albans Town, but because it was in St. Albans Town, it was different than St. Albans City, so it technically didn't count. Um, is there any, it, it just, the municipal boundaries are, that's what we're deciding on. So if you have a zoning in one area, but it's like 500 feet over the line in another town, then you can't, mm -hmm. it doesn't count. Uh, I think so. Okay. And there's really no way that we can address that without, I think, a way to get for So, okay. No. Thank you. Um, we're afternoon, and this is, there's still quite a bit in this section. So, rather, we should want to do that. How about if we, I think we got down to um, sub two, line 20, page 54. Sure. Can I flag something before you go off live? So, yes, the intent of the house was to have the municipality. You know, there's been conversations in prior, many, many prior sessions about like the concept of like municipal delegation. This is fairly close in a lot of ways, I think, to municipal delegation of Act 250. And so the list of requirements here was, as I was saying, to line up with functionally equivalent bylaws to address all of the Act 250 criteria. Um, Page 54. You, for can choose to, you know, add or remove to this list that the house formulated. You may want to consider if any of the criteria are missing. For example, primary agricultural soils. Are there primary agricultural soils in these cores? Maybe not. Sure. I don't know. Or criteria 9F. Which is uh are we TVs? Oh and as you will recall from your discussion about that already, since Act 250 is one of the primary mechanisms for enforcing RV and the RVs and CDs, yeah. so you may want to think about that. Thank you. But my understanding is that a lot of the Act 50 criteria are still covered by other existing state permits, except for wildlife. And, and the two covers. I just listed. Oh, and okay, so and the RVs and CBs. Primary agricultural soils. So there's no state permit around uh, primary ag soils. Correct. Forest soils, extraction of earth resources. There's nothing, there's no state permit for any of that. I mean, if you're doing actual extraction, you will probably potentially need a permit, but there are other dimensions under Act 250 that will not be covered. So there are other things, and whether or not or extraction of resources would come up in a core. You know, I think the House had some thoughts that that would maybe be unlikely, but primary agricultural soils and energy conservation strike me as two potential gaps, and there actually may be a couple others. Soil erosion, just in general. You're preparing for it. Mm -hmm. But a stormwater permit, yeah. Erosion. I, I don't know. Well, I was thinking about Montpelier's zoning, and we, we have stuff about erosion. Um, so it feels like that would be an easy one to just require. There's plenty of examples around that. Um, I know this question is probably not for you. But it, I'm wondering if there are other municipal bylaws that exist around the state that might address ag soils, forest soils, um, that would make it easy, to, equally as easy to say, you know, along with wildlife regulations, you need to you need to check these other boxes as well. Um, and I don't. Um, sometimes when we're trying to help make municipality do something like this, we have the models, bylaws, or something like that. Was there a discussion of, you know, sort of a model? You know, people 
see what would be a complete plan regarding the construction. Um, there have been in earlier versions um, directions, specific directives to the board to adopt model bylaws. Um, there isn't, I don't think, model bylaws in here other than there, the board is supposed to come up with guidance. Well, and also 213 is reminding me again because we talked about model bylaws for flood hazard areas. Um, that those already exist. Yeah, I think we're talking the states conflating well, for that's maybe 213, but take them up a level, make them more protective. Um, and then a process. To look at how they be rolled out. Okay, great. So I've marked this at line 20 on page 54. Thank you very much. Um, if uh, a bit of a broken record, I'm doing it myself, so I won't ask if people to do it. Not subject to but if people can read ahead and I will help us make, we're in this squeeze here, I'm going to make some tiny progress, but not. Well, past things so quickly that we don't understand what we're Okay, with that, thank you. Everyone.